five, four, three, two, one, zero. All engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. Hello, space enthusiasts. Welcome to another episode of the Space Business Podcast where we investigate all the exciting ways in which people participate in the new space economy by conversations with entrepreneurs, executives, investors, and other members of the space family. My name is Raphael Rodkin, and I'm an investor in and advisor to space companies. Just as a reminder, this podcast is for informational purposes only, and nothing should be taken as investment advice. This podcast is sponsored by Nanoavionics, a satellite bus manufacturer and mission integrator. Their satellite technologies enable many space companies worldwide to offer services that improve life here on Earth, such as providing global connectivity, conducting Earth observation for various purposes, or contributing to scientific discoveries. Check them out and also check out my episode with their CEO and co-founder. Sadly, I am not a rocket scientist, but I'm an alumnus of the International Space University, or ISU, which is also our partner in this podcast. ISU offers a number of educational programs about space worldwide, ranging from executive courses lasting a few days all the way to a one-year master's. Check them out at isunet.ed. We are having another episode with an Earth observation, or more generically, remote sensing company. Aurora Tech, based in Munich in Germany, uses satellites to detect wildfires. That has obviously been a big topic with relatively recent fires in places like Australia, Brazil, and California. I caught up with Thomas Grubler, Aerotech's co-founder and CEO. Please enjoy our conversation. Hey, everybody. We're back again with another episode. I have my friend Thomas Grubler here, who is the co-founder and CEO of Aerotech, German remote sensing company. Hey, Thomas, welcome. Hi, Raphael. Thanks for inviting me. It's a pleasure to have you. And uh, can you give us the elevator pitch on your company, please? Of course. Aurora Tech is based on working on new space intelligence for a sustainable Earth. And we started with one specific product, wildfire detection. We are the number one wildfire service company from risk assessment, wildfire early detection, and damage analysis. So our customers use our system to send off planes and to extinguish wildfires. And this is actually quite ironic because before we started recording here, we were chatting about our favorite corona lockdown activities. And we were just saying that we both like to take cold baths and cold rivers and cold lakes. <laughs> the wildfires is quite the opposite. But I got to ask, so within the sort of remote sensing universe, there's obviously, as we know, myriad use cases, but wildfires is a pretty specific one. What's the origin story here behind this? How did you guys get to do this? Like, why did you think of this? Yeah, we actually came from an infrared page. So we started, when we founded Aurora Tech, we found out that there's a huge lack in thermal infrared data and no one is currently addressing it. And due to my former work experience in optics, it was quite ununderstandable why no one is doing thermal infrared. So we started with thermal infrared and with the vision of building a constellation for thermal infrared. But recently, uh, we then also came to the conclusion to start a new space company today. It's much better to build an MVP and then build this MVP like a software as a service company. And at some time, you can upgrade the customer's better service level. And for us, the MVP is the wildfire service. And we can later upgrade our customers to a better service level, so faster detection, more accurate detection. And on the other side, of course, we have the data for other use cases in our system. Okay, so let's take a step back here because we are a non-technical podcast because we're trying to get more and more people into the, the space sector. Can you just ever so briefly go into the details of like how infrared is different from just plain old optical remote sensing? You need to understand that infrared is actually a very broad definition. Optics is from 400 to 700 nanometers roundabout. And infrared is actually starting at an 8-900 and then going to 12 micrometers and more. So it's extremely broad and there's so many different bands in infrared that all have different kinds of effects. Like uh, between 8 and 900, you can really find out if a plant is growing. Then on the other hand, if you go more up, 
Um, infrared is mainly focused on, on temperature or mainly driven by the temperature of something. You can imagine that everything which has a temperature and this, this is everything above zero Kelvin has some radiation and this radiation is going into the infrared range. And if you are um, something have like room temperature, you have a very good radiation at 10, 11 micrometers. So the peak of the radiation. And the hotter something gets, the more the radiation goes to a lower number. So if you have a fire, for example, it has the highest radiation at about 4 micrometers. And you also have radiation at 10 micrometers. And if it's even hotter than a fire, then you could come down into the other ranges. Is this somehow understandable? Yeah, yeah, so ab absolutely. So I, I think one point is probably that also you can just detect certain phenomena, including phenomena which are not visible yeah. to the within the optical range of the human eye. And you mentioned some interesting examples already, sort of that it's almost like any heat emission, right? So I was going to come back to my question, how you guys decided on wildfires as the first step. I mean, I understand that you said later on you could have other use cases, but I guess there is other use cases where it may be useful to know that there are thermal emissions, right? Like, for example, I think people have been thinking about use cases like you can tell whether an industrial complex is active or not, because if it's active, like a chemical plant or a steel plant, right, then it's 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 hot. Correct. Yeah, we went through a list of use cases and Wi-Fi use case has two big or three big advantages. On the first part, um, yeah, it's hard to say it's an advantage, but it's really a huge problem today. So something we really thought of, we wanted to solve it. And on the other part, you can easily build an a minimum viable product with the existing data, at least for the beginning, and, and have a working UI for the customers to try it out. And for us, it was also a little bit personal. Like I liked it as I was a fireman before coming to Munich, and then you want this back probably at some time. So there are many things coming together, and white fires. Uh, we also found out when we talked with all these different customers that in the white fire scene, the customers are really rarely using their today satellite data. They are not using it mostly. And we found out why aren't they using it? So it was really the low-hanging fruit uh, kickoff product. That, that's actually very interesting. So when you said you were a fireman, I assume you were probably one of those uh, members of one of those volunteer fire forces like we have them here in Switzerland too. I, I even thought about joining them at some point in time, but honestly, we don't even have any fires. It's mostly rescuing cats. But, but since you have that experience of the volunteer of firemen, I mean, did you kind of get that experience with the wildfires and sort of like, where does the data come from at the moment, like how do people detect wildfires? Is it just people randomly detecting it? Is it planes? Is it some other way? Yeah, it's hard to compare countries like Austria or Germany or Switzerland uh, with South America, Australia, Canada and so on. So in Austria at home, every wildfire was actually within minutes reported by somebody walking through the forest. But the difference is in like Australia, so there's so huge forests without any people in it. So there's no one walking around because the forest is far too huge. And in these areas, they actually deploy towers and then there are people standing on the tower and really watching if there's a fire the whole day. It's just their job to stand on the tower and watch for a fire. The same they do all over the world in South America and apparently also in the northern Germany in Nordrhein-Westfalen. And the other part is flying around with planes. If there's a hot day, they fly around with a plane, look out of the window if it's burning. And they do this in Australia, Canada, and so it's very uh, regularly. But even in Bavaria, we have, I think, 100 or 200 planes and a lot of pilots. So I'm not sure with the planes, but I'm sure that there are over 100 pilots which are really ready to fly around on a very hot summer day. So I got to ask a stupid question. So you're saying on the towers that it's literally like people watching like manually with their eyes. Like why wouldn't they just put the, the same types of sensors you guys are using onto the towers? They even did this. So there are towers with similar sensors in thermal infrared available. And there are also towers available with normal cameras on it. So these tower systems exist. The only problem is that they have actually high cost or and have needed really a lot of, let's say, uh, setup costs up front. You need internet, power, everything in the middle of nowhere. And then I guess one one tower can only survey a certain, obviously, area before you need to build the next tower. I'm going to assume that's one of the advantages of, of the satellite then, or the plane. Exactly. So you need quite a lot of towers. Um, 
our typical customer has 1 million of hectares of forest. So you can assume with 1 million hectares, they have a lot of towers. And then you, you mentioned that, so it gets very expensive. But then I guess, um, at, at least historically, the prejudice would have been well spaced. That's even probably even more expensive. But I assume that, that that's as with many of the business models, if not all of the business models we, we have here on the podcast and that we currently have up and coming, they are now made possible because the costs of the satellites have come down so much can you talk a little bit about that how you know how much an infrared satellite costs of the type that you guys are using and how that may compare to to like i don't know 10 years ago or so that's really today's time that you have such a huge cost decrease in the space segment and the rocket compared to the time before that in my opinion satellites are currently the cheapest solution for anything if you want to do it globally or you have customers all over the world. It's even cheaper than all the drone systems, in my opinion, because with a drone system or these high altitude solar satellites, these drones flying in higher altitudes for a few months with solar power and so on, they also need to launch, they need to land, um, they need uh, moving parts like a propeller um, to keep them in, this, in, in the air and a battery and to keep them in the air overnight and working. So all of this is not so perfect. And in space, you, the satellite is just flying in its uh, circle around the Earth and staying there. If you have propulsion or not, and the attitude control that it looks to the ground can be done without any propulsion. So and satellites before, uh, like the satellites we currently use for our system uh, or have included, they are often at the weight of a ton. So... And if you have a ton of a satellite, that's very, very heavy. Like, like imagine you have a small car in space. This is the typical size of many satellites. And now it's changing. Now satellites are more like at the size of a fridge. Or our satellites even go a step further. So our satellites are at the size of a shoebox with probably five or six kilograms. This is also made possible through all the developments of smartphones so smartphones actually made it possible to have huge developments in making power efficient uh, microcontrollers or processors power efficient graphic units high volumes of uh, production for lithium ion cells all these developments made it possible now to go to space again um, with them the important point here being which i think you implied What's that the price? <laughs> yeah that, that too but so you were talking about the one ton the, the historical one ton satellite and, and one ton that's like you know one metric mm -hmm. ton is a thousand kilograms and so even on spacex ride share which is one of the cheapest options right it's five thousand dollars a kilogram so just for the launch you would be like at five million dollars whereas you say if you know your unit weighs like instead of a thousand kilograms five kilograms then it's suddenly twenty five thousand dollars instead of five million dollars which makes a huge difference but i guess i just wanted to confirm what i think you implied is that obviously the point being that the capabilities of the satellite for your purposes of the shoebox satellites are as good as the capabilities of the one ton satellite exactly the capabilities are nearly as good also due to the sensor development and so we can build a better resolution camera than what's currently in space. But you also need to understand that what's currently in space was planned 10, 20 years ago. And now they're planning new satellites going to space, which probably will again take 10 years to be in space. So this is a traditional development timeline. We just so much better with these small satellites because we don't need uh, so many years to plan, build and launches. We can actually do it within a year and less and therefore, we can really use the newest technology always and uh, ahead of many years. So, so, so what you're telling me is then you guys are, have basically decided you will have your own satellites, your own constellation. You will not continue to use other people's satellites. We will also continue to use other people's satellites. And probably if there's a competition coming up, also launching from an infrared satellite, we will probably also buy their data if there's a demand from a customer. So... What we are doing with our constellation, our very first constellation, we are just um, complementing what's already in space. There we come back to white fires again. We know that fires are burning in the afternoon. And we have already existing data from noon, from night, evening, uh, from the morning, but not from the afternoon. So our first satellites, we go up in the late afternoon. So this 
sun-synchronous orbit, which is then placed in the late afternoon, and take only a picture one time a day in the late afternoon of every place on Earth. And therefore, we get the highest fraction of fires detected with just a little number of satellites, just 14. So, so, just again, so this is on your own future constellation, this daily revisit of, I assume, certain interesting, like you mentioned before, areas of large forest, uh, which I imagine is stuff like California, Australia, Brazil, and, and so forth. And so that, that capability currently does not exist with other satellites. In the late afternoon, it doesn't exist at the moment. Okay. And that's the problem, that at the afternoon, there are most fires burning, you can imagine, it's always the hot test in the afternoon and in the afternoon there are not enough satellites or no thermal infrared imaging satellites and therefore most of the fires are missed in this time. I just want to drill down a little bit further on this, this key question of you know having your own constellation or not because I think it's a key question that probably many if not most remote sensing startups are asking themselves right because obviously it also has the financial implications even though as you as you said it's become so much cheaper to actually build and launch a satellite it still makes a huge difference whether you do launch your own satellite or you don't do you see any possibility that in the future there might be other ways of you know renting like hosted payloads or something on other large constellations like we, we obviously have large constellations in remote sensing on the optical side like like planet right and then certain other large constellations I mean, and even Starlink for that point of view. I mean, could there ever be a possibility that other large constellations could simply have a infrared payload on their constellations that you could rent? And would you consider that? I don't think. So there are the different answers or more complex answers. Um, I don't think that you can ever really rent some payload. Or, so the problem is if the data is not existent, you need to get up the sensor. You cannot change a satellite which is already in space sure. operational. Especially at the moment, we're still in the process of building up the infrastructure. So at the moment, most of the startups building satellites are actually here to, to add a new data set. But of course, and in this taking new data set, there is of course the option at the moment that there are also a lot of companies which are experts in building satellites. Mm -hmm. and in this case, you really don't need to own the satellite to say that it is your satellite. You can actually contract a company to build your satellite, to mm -hmm. launch it for you, to operate it for you. And in the contract, the satellite always stays or is owned by this other company, but the company is then always contracted to give you the data. It's like... Mm -hmm a leasing or like mm -hmm. a car renting model when you have a long-term rent for a car, which you can't cancel as the car mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. satellite stays in space. Mm -hmm. That's actually, so that brings me to another mm -hmm. uh, related question, which you're already touching upon now. So, okay. So we talked about, okay, why, why may, why do you want to have your own constellation? Okay. So let's, let's assume, you know, that, that, that is true. You, you want your own constellation. So then the next yeah. decision is that many uh, startups are facing or all of the startups that want to have their own constellations are facing is, do you build the satellites in-house for some reason? Or do you go to like, you know, shout out to our sponsor or somebody like Nano Avionics and they build the constellation for you? What are you guys thinking about that question? There's no correct answer, I think, at the moment to, to this question. Every startup needs to find their own way to go. But I really think that especially at the beginning for the first satellites to prove it that it's working or if you're just building a small number of satellites, um, you should go over some hosted payload platform provider service. And the other part, for a really, really long term, it's probably cheaper to build your satellites on your own or with the partner, but to own them. It's like also with these cloud computing services. Of course, you can have all your computers in the cloud, paid by minute, at AWS, Google, and so on. But at the time when you decide to run the computer day and night, all the time, it gets much cheaper if you rent it somewhere else or even have it in-house. So it depends. It depends uh, where you go. and But I also think this number is going higher and higher. So I think two or three years ago, there was a publication by Spaceworks. And in this publication, they said after, I think, at about 100 satellites, it's cheaper to build the communication satellite on your own. And I think this number is slowly going up to the future. And there we need to find out how it moves and where we go yeah I mean, there's, there's obviously the, the the most prominent example spacex with its communicate with its starting mm -hmm. satellites um but i guess they're a total outlier they're now producing i think at a clip of 120 satellites 
a month, which is probably unrivaled yeah, it's anywhere. Also, yeah, it's also something good if you build it on your own. The good thing is that you, you actually control every part of your satellite, so you can really push it to the limits. You see it like Tesla is doing, and so they control every part, and so they can push the car to the limit. On the other part, if you buy a different part, you can't control anything, and you need to ask your vendor, can you change this and the other this? And then they are not sitting on the same table anymore, but you have a lot of interfaces, and that can make it complex. On the other hand, it makes it faster. So you need to find out where do you want to be fast, in which part of your satellite, and in which part uh, do you want to abstract as much as possible because you just don't want to do it. Going a little bit more to an abstract level, I mean, the last couple of questions I asked, which is mm. respectively, you know, whether you guys want your own constellation and then whether you build your own satellites or not. I mean, it's basically all about vertical integration, right? How, yeah. how vertically integrated do you want to be? And I guess part of the thinking about that is your guys thinking on like where do you see most of your value add to the final customer like you know is it is it like mostly for example in the final data analysis and the detection algorithms mm. or do you really do see it as the integrated stack where you cannot really separate one part from from the other i see at the end it comes at the end always down to the information for the customer and the customer actually doesn't care how you do it we just need, need to get him the information and in this case we try to abstract as much as possible and only do on your own what you can't procure something what you can't buy but also buying has some risk especially if you go for development work so i would never do development completely outside with, without understanding what you do but if there's something in, available to buy then you should really buy it if it fits to you and this is very often also the case and um, in, in this thing I, I want to go back to some first question again where you said yeah if you buy the satellites in future but if you have new satellites in future and, and i said currently we are building up this infrastructure of sensors in my far far future vision all the sensor sensors are already in space because so many startups like us have sent up new sensors so they're all there and then it mm -hmm. comes down to to speed so who has data or information first mm -hmm. this then we are only separating on with the data first in the next step and there we will have something like apps on a satellite so like you want to detect fires as quick as possible so you upload a fire detection app on every satellite where you can upload something mm -hmm. this app is detecting it in space and then can transfer this information only over some uh, expensive inter-satellite link directly down to earth yeah i totally agree with you i mean sort of in my main day-to-day -day activity as a venture capital investor in space I, I come across so many startups and business models right and certainly there's a number of people now working on let's call it generic in space platform right where mm -hmm. it's basically a satellite that will have the most common sensors so like let's say an optical an infrared a sar mm -hmm. as well as a software defined radio on board as well as probably at that point in time also like a like a laser communications terminal and you can basically rent it for whatever your use case is and then so you rent the time on, on these platforms on these platform satellites then you may be able to um, also rent time on on relay services which may be able to to get your information back to Earth as quickly as possible. Um, you may be able to rent time on in-space data centers, which mm. may be able to do some edge computing right in space, right? To sort of like uh, have part of your algorithm in space, right? That basically makes a first determination of like, well, could this be a wildfire or not? Um, and then discards it if it's, if it's not. Imagine one space one time further, you do the edge computing in space, you find out that there's some information and then you can target in space already the next satellite to take the next picture. Mm -hmm. You can do all this analysis and so all the software in space targeting several satellites, taking different data records from some place and then transmitting the information. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Makes a lot of sense. So I want to I wanna talk a little bit about your customers because you already mentioned um, Another thing which I very much agree with is that at the end of the day, the, the non-space customers don't really care that the data or the service or the product comes from space. That's almost incidental. So who are your main customers and, you know, how was it finding them, approaching them? Like, um, what did they think about that whole space angle? Did they think it was weird? Was there a challenge kind of getting into the door? Like, what, what was your experience with the customers? Our customers have actually two sides. On the one hand, they like the we build satellites and so that 
always gives you some step into the door that makes it much easier. On the other hand, they are already, they are very often also very used to traditional processes because it's emergency response. You probably know in an emergency, you don't always want to change everything, but you do what's working because you need to get it working. Sure. And in this case, they are used, for example, to the tower observation, plane flights, and so on. And in this case, they know, yeah, when I fly around with a plane, I see the fire and directly, and then I can alarm it, and that's it. And then our first, let's say, challenge was to prove it to the customers that our system where we are total honest engineers is even useful when it doesn't detect fires for a few hours in the afternoon. And they said, yeah, but with the plane, I detect it faster and so on and this and this and this. And then we were actually also lucky because we launched the product in some alpha version in spring. And then, yeah, it was probably ready in summer. And in spring, then there came the lockdown, which was for us partly also a lucky thing as one car or one at that time uh, lead or opportunity and not really customers that, yeah, um, I've all my people are now in, at home in home office or, or they are not allowed to stand in the towers anymore. And so there was no yes. one observing for fires, but they had 1 million of hectares of forest plus their own private fire brigade and so on. They needed a solution. And then, then yeah, we made a quick trial. And then within a few weeks, we also detected a few fires and they were able to extinguish the fires early enough. So we could really prove, yeah, our system is detecting fires early enough that you can extinguish them. And this was the first proof we had and which made it possible to approach further customers and also convert this, this lead into a customer. And also currently customers. So last summer, we had then several customers in a trial uh, also paid trial, but in a trial where they tried it out and wanted to know, yeah, does it really work? And we could prove it that it worked. Our system detected fires where they didn't see one, although they have towers or although they are flying around with a plane and so on. Just in November, we were able to probably detect a very, so detect a fire, which could probably be very, very, got very, very huge because but it started in the night. No one knows who started yeah. it, but it started in the night and no one was observing the fire from the towers in the night. So they were really lucky to have our system. And are those typically commercial customers, like, like say, owners of forests, like paper companies or government customers or both? It's both. So on the one hand, paper companies, commercial forestries and um, the other part, of course, the public services, public wildfire service, public forest service, and so on. And I assume it's some sort of subscription model where they probably pay by, like like you said, a number of hectares, which are under surveillance or something like that. It's a subscription model, um, mainly targeted on the size and on the or some of the damages and so they have. So it, it depends what service level they need. Okay. And for that, I guess they get some sort of access to what I assume is a proprietary online platform where you log in and then you get um, surveillance data and alerts and, and things like that. Is that how I should imagine it? Yeah, exactly. Actually, it's a it's an online service with a, where you see a nice map with different overlays for fire risk and so on. And then the customers can mark the area or uh, give us their shape file and we integrate it. And then when there's a fire in their area, they get an email or a notification with an API in their control room and see there's a new fire and then they can react on it. And, and so this, 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 this building the, the platform and I guess the most important part of the platform obviously is the, the detection algorithms. Mm -hmm. You do all of that in-house, right? Yeah, so the platform, of course, it's completely in-house. Also, the, the data integration is a um, very important part here. Yeah. Um, yeah, actually, we do all of it in-house, mainly also because some of the data, this is not available on these standard Earth observation data hubs. As we are based on thermal infrared data, we also aggregate data from weather satellites and other satellite sources all over the globe. So we have the JAXA, the NASA, and the, and the European 
uh, humans uh, data integrated. Company. Interesting, yeah. I forgot to ask you about your, your data sources. So yeah. it's a lot of the public, uh, basically the publicly owned satellites. It's a lot of the publicly owned satellites, exactly. And we also deployed, uh, developed our own algorithm um, to take fires where it's not yet possible. We have own algorithms to remove the false positives as current or these other public systems have a lot of false positives. We try to be really on the front to reduce the number of, of false voice alerts so that they don't start a plane when there's no fire and we try to understand the fire so we cluster the fire over the pixels from several different satellite passes so we try we combine the data from different data sources plus then you can observe the fire with our data where it will move we already have some preliminary arrows in our system showing where the fire will probably move and we are also now working on, on fire simulation probably launch it in, in summer or, or autumn that you can see in which direction is the fire moving and will it move will it hit a city will it hit power plant or some electric grid or will it just uh, go in different direction and hurt no one will it stop because there's a lake in between that's all questions you need to find out and but we also try to add additional data to the system and the customer you know i just thought about something for some reason i never thought about when i talk to remote sensing companies like yours but because you are vertically integrated at least for the moment mm. it's, it's really you need like almost three different skill sets in the company right you, you need like the, the people who can sort of like build the thermal infrared sensor pod and mm. understand the technology behind that then you basically need people who know how to do satellite integration right because you are building your own satellites mm. and then you have the data science expertise and which is probably the one i probably know best because i have a graduate degree in, in, in data science so they're kind of separate skill sets i mean was that something that was present on the founding team or did you kind of then find people afterwards to complement that or and how is it working together with between those different um skill sets and team members our founding team started also diverse so we had skills in building satellites um we had skills in in software um Flo is a computer scientist um, so he has also skills even in front-end development which is also needed in the skill here and we had skills in sales and marketing already so that's our these are all things that come together. But in my opinion, this vertical integration, this part, that's actually the, the secret source to win because you can't just do a system where you have... So in my opinion, we can't just build a system where you have all the data and then do some analysis for Earth observation data and all generic. Mm -hmm. On the other part, you can't do just this fire service without understanding, um, without being able to add the data the customers want, then you can't win. And I'm also not a huge friend of this super generic satellites with 15 different sensors on it mm. and someone will buy it. I'm sure if you build a super generic satellite, then there will be just half of the sensors used. So it must get so cheap that you can send up unused material, which is at the moment not possible. And through this vertical integration or vertical understanding down to the customer, you can be far, far more efficient on the space side. So I think through this, we can, even if it's already very cheap to build the nanosatellite, we can even save 10 times of the money of unused space infrastructure because we only send up what's really needed. And what we send up is then directly in production sent to the customer. Yeah, and you're touching about something which I definitely agree with, which is a lot of remote sensing startups have not, they're not customer centric enough, I suppose. I think they haven't, they, haven't, they haven't consulted the customers enough about what they really need and then sort of almost backward design the process. It seems like many times with remote sensing startups because they are so technology driven, it's, it's basically, they came up with technology and then they're trying to convince the customer that that's a cool technology where they should buy the data. <laughs> Rafael, what we are actually doing is we build up a customer side and when our satellites are in space, they all have a customer on the other side already. They are all waiting for it. So we will never have data in space generating and need to prove it. And then after two or three years, we can sell it to the customer. All the customers, everything is already here and we send it up only to meet the customer demand. We will never have unused infrastructure in space, which is a huge 
difference to all the existing base startups launching satellites as they normally send up something, need to prove that it works, do a demo a few years, hire a lot of salesperson, and then slowly ramp up sales in this process. Speaking of your customer group, so again, I understood you're starting with wildfires, but sort of medium long-term planning, do, do you think you will expand out to other verticals and use cases? Mm, for sure, we will expand. Currently, we are also expanding in the, we are already expanding in the fire scene. So we also started a project now with ESA, OMV and the World Bank okay. to detect and reduce the gas flaring globally of the refineries. So here we try to combine the fire data with methane data. And where we are really see also huge use cases in this uh, industry observation. So we saw also, especially in the lockdown, and you already mentioned it, you saw all the steel manufacturers uh, shutting down. But with high accurate from infrared data, you can actually observe every production facility from space and build production market index, uh, indices from space. I did ask you about the temporal resolution, mm -hmm. right? How many times you fly over the same area. But it actually didn't ask you about the spatial resolution, so sort of like the, the, the size of objects you're able to detect um, uh, on the ground. We're currently aiming for 200 meters uh, spatial resolution. Okay, which I assume for wildfires and even the industrial use cases is... It's probably sufficient, right? Just that you compare most of the data we use at the moment in our system as a one to three kilometers per pixel spatial resolution. That's most of the thermal infrared data you can get. You you have thermal infrared data which with much higher resolution and like from Landsat, but this data only comes every few weeks, so you can't really use it in for our purpose, only for observation. And we're the first one with a high spatial resolution setup. Yeah, and, and I guess that also answers Another question I had, which is whether there were any sort of military use cases, I was thinking like, well, we may be detecting missiles or something, but I guess then you would need, you would need a much, much higher revisit time and, and a better spatial resolution uh, too. So I'm not even sure that's possible technologically. Probably, probably not. So just to be honest, if you have something heating up, you can work on the subpixel element. So if there's just a few meters thing heating up, the whole pixel will have a higher will have a high intensity measured, so you can always use the data for also very small occurrences or temperatures. But um, of course, for missiles and so it probably get a little bit complex. But this is also not our focus. Uh, our part, what we do now, we we can make a lot of money and even more money by saving the world at the moment. That's far more interesting and a quicker customer than the missile customer. So I guess that's interesting. I didn't think about this. I guess what you're saying is related to the spatial resolution. So even if you are at, um, what is this, 200 meter spatial resolution, even if you have a fire that's much smaller than that, because of the heat intensity and the fire radiating the heat out, that's why you're still able to detect a much smaller fire on the 200 meter square uh, tile or whatever, sorry, on the, on the 200 meter circle, so to say. Exactly. Okay, I quickly wanted to, um, we, we touched upon a little bit already, so talk about just sort of your execution plan. So right now you're using third-party data, then at the, mm -hmm. the, the medium term end goal is basically to have your own constellation. Did you have a in-between step um, where you were going to be using something like a hosted payload? We also have this in-between step. So our very first camera is now we go up next winter with a hosted payload mission from the satellite application catapult program. And there we will prove that the camera works. So we do it just step by step. And just shortly after, we will send up our first precursor mission where we are also at the moment um, collecting offers from different vendors uh, for hosted payload missions to decide where we will go. Okay, great. And so that's the satellite uh, um, catapult you mentioned. This is the, the entity out of the UK. So despite Brexit, uh, that's still accessible to non-UK companies, I hope. Yeah, despite Brexit, it's still accessible. And we are still in this program. And we also have our UK daughter company registered for this purpose. Gotcha. And you mentioned, Asa, um with ASA, what's your relationship? Is it contracts? Were you part of a, one of the, incub the business incubators at some point in time? Did you receive any other help from ASA? We were part from the ASA Business Incubation Center from uh, 2018 to 2019. So after founding the company in September 2018, which was, especially in these early phases, a lot of very good support to us. Now we 
we have a lot of ESA contracts ongoing. So ESA have, has launched very, very good uh, program for developing your your first ideas or your product. And we also applied now for other larger ESA contracts. So ESA is also doing a very good job in enabling startups working in space on working on space hardware because they also give out contracts for developing parts of the satellite or parts of our wildfire service and so on. And this gives us actually some, as a startup, some non-dilutive uh, money. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And if, if that was the ASAP big um, mm-hmm. in, uh, around the Munich region, that's probably the same that um, that that Lilium, the electric plane company, came out Ooh. of, right? Yeah, true. Lilium was also in the same ESA big. I think the, the office from Lilium is also just on the other side of the street from the Munich ESA big. So that actually brings me to an interesting point I almost forgot to ask. So you guys sitting in Munich, and Munich is becoming really quiet. I guess it's always been in some way uh, throughout history, but it's it's now, even with new space, it's becoming quite a dynamic center, right? I mean, we also just before Christmas had the news of uh, the fundraising round for the local rocket company, ESA Aerospace, for 75 million euros. How do you like being based in Munich and the, the, the space ecosystem there? Yeah, I mean, two or three years ago, or a few years ago, everyone was saying Berlin is the startup city of Germany. Oh, for fintech, yeah. Uh, and internet, yes. For fintech, internet, food tech, food delivery, e-scooters, all these, but all the high technology stuff is going on in Munich because... In my opinion, Munich is a very, very good university, the technical university. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, next to the TUM, there's also the LMU uh, university. Mm-hmm. And both are one of our huge and very famous and well-known universities. We have the UniPW from the Bundeswehr class. Um, at the, at the TUM, we have the Unternehmertum, which is actually a separate organization, um, which is uh, pushing um, startups in Munich extremely. So the Unternehmertum has a lot of programs um, enabling students, PhDs um, to go further and, and support uh, students in, in doing and um, coach startup uh, students in making startups or coaching startups. So they all build up a huge ecosystem. The UniPW also just launched a uh, uh, founders at UniPW um, Accelerator, also with a focus on new space. Um, mm-hmm. I saw that. I think that was in partnership even with, with Knast, the French, or there was there was some yeah, partnership. Yeah, partnership there. with them. And I will be also a mentor in this uh, round there. <laughs> Fantastic. And um, since we have non-German listeners, UniPW, that stands for uh, the University of the Bundeswehr, which is basically the German German asked armed forces. So that's also a very, very interesting um, academic institution. So is that is that ecosystem in Munich very tight? Like you guys regularly meet up and exchange experiences and views or just have a beer when, when there's no lockdown? That, that's true. Yeah. If we, we actually tied it up at the beginning of last year with launching our space brewery, some uh, Munich new space uh, beer round. Like, you know, in Munich, everyone is going to the Oktoberfest, but we also go to the, to the breweries the rest of the year. And we did it exactly one time and then we went online and now everyone can join international. So we went international. And so if you want to join also, Tune in on spacebrewery.com, uh, join our meetup group and join one of the next talks. So, so my suggestion or desire for the Space Brewery to you would then be if if we will have an Oktoberfest again this year, I mean, who knows? I hope so. We should have a big Munich new space table in, in one of the tents like Schottenhammel and, and all meet up there. That's the plan. That's the plan. <laughs> Fantastic. Very happy to hear. <laughs> Thomas, we're running out of time, so I'm going to finish up here on our two standard questions. The, the first one being, if if you weren't doing Aurora, but uh, assuming you still were doing something in space because you like space, what what might you be doing? Mm, I think this option doesn't exist as I would do Aurora Tech. Um, <laughs> if, I, if I wouldn't do anything in space, so some years ago, there would have been other technology startups probably. But at the moment, I think uh, space is the space is the economy of the future, and it's like everyone wanted to buy some bitcoins. Or everyone today says, "Yeah, what would have been if I would have bought bitcoins ten years ago?" Mm-hmm. So you you better go into space now because otherwise you say in ten years, "Ah, I should I should have tried space ten years ago. There was it so easy to invest and to build up new ideas and so on." Uh, right, right, right. Yeah, I certainly, I certainly agree with that. And uh, I, I think it's a, 
better and more sustainable option than trying to buy GameStop or some other stock at the moment. Uh, unfortunately, yeah, yeah, with GameStop, you never know exactly. <laughs> but I really think with, with, with new space, you, you can do two things. On the one hand, you cannot only invest in the, fu in the future for space and this observation, but you also invest in something sustainable as new space really allow us to understand climate change is better. It allows us to tackle um, what's coming up with climate change, with getting drier fields, um, detecting water, um, using our resources more efficiently. Um, the wildfire topic, of course, all these problems um, or challenges coming up with the climate change are now tackable with technologies from new space. And so it's another reason It helps us to reduce the climate change, plus it helps us to work with the risks and challenges coming up through climate change. So in any case, it's worthful to invest in it and to go into it. And whether you invest money or just your time, everything is good. I, I, I so agree. It's just, it's just very fulfilling. And it's just what you're doing is just one of many examples how space mm -hmm. will actually make life on, on Earth better in, in the future. And the future brings me to the final question, which is visions of the future and specifically science fiction. And Thomas, do, do you like science fiction? And if no, that's fine too. Um, but if yes, what kind of science fiction do you like? Like books and movies and specific examples? Yeah, I really grew up with uh, Starship Enterprise and Star Trek and I like all the stories I'm, I'm never uh, I was never a Star Wars fan but I always uh, like the Star Trek and um, Starship Enterprise topics because they also included some some work in physics in Star Wars you always mm -hmm. use a little bit of physics also in the spaceships but it's, it's Star Trek they all explain the warp drive and so on and I, I also think many things came true and I I'm very sure that yeah we will have interstellar travel and so on at some time. I don't know if we will see it, but I'm really very sure that this will come and there are huge change, chances that this is possible. Probably, I mean, there are some NASA researchers already proved on paper that you can build a warp drive and so many things were already proved on paper and probably there will be an intelligent engineer coming up with a solution or someone will develop the new uh, artificial intelligence to develop the solution. We will find out, but we will do it at some time. I know. That's great. And, and, and until we can reliably and quickly travel to other worlds and settle there, we got to keep our own home planet safe and in, environmentally safe. And that's, that's where Aurora comes in. And so Thomas, thank you very much for your time. Best of luck with Aurora. And I hope to see you at the latest at Oktoberfest in the tent. Rafael, also, thanks for taking your time and thanks for interviewing me. I hope we see us earlier than at Oktoberfest, which is actually already scheduled, so it will happen. They plan it. Uh, let's see. <laughs> Good to hear. Speak soon. Well, that's it for another nominal episode of the Space Business Podcast. If you like this podcast, please consider giving it a five-star rating on your favorite podcast platform, such as iTunes. You can follow us on Twitter at podcast underscore space. Also consider supporting us at www.patreon.com forward slash space business podcast. If the podcast got you interested in learning more about the business opportunities in the space economy, check out my new online course on space entrepreneurship on udemy.com. The link is in the episode description. Lastly, if you have any feedback, including ideas for guests, And that may include yourself if you have an exciting space story to tell or interested in being a sponsor. Drop us an email at spacebusinesspodcast at gmail.com. I look forward to seeing you for the next episode.